three people gone in a single episode. Jesus Christ, man. This episode got really damn intense, really damn quick. I mean, straight up, shit was going crazy on all sides. There were already death flags all over the place. And it was surprisingly not the people that I thought that were going to die that ended up dying. I mean, for all people. Kitty kitty. Really? God damn, that was just so intense. I mean, she planted like a dozen death flags on herself, which makes so much sense because she literally knew she was going to die. But at the same time, oh man, it was just so painful watching it happen. I mean, when she was first like talking about Naegi without him like making it clear he was behind her and she'd said some sweet things and then she noticed his presence and was just like shaking it off, like turning away and coughing. It was so cute. And then when they were sitting down having a nice meal together, I knew straight away like someone in that group was going to die. And then shit just kept going with Kirigiri actually taking off her damn glove and putting her hand on top of Naegi's. Man, I was so sad there. I mean, as soon as she took off her glove, I thought she was actually going to slap Naegi. I thought it was going to be a like, get a hold of yourself kind of thing to snap him out of his whole, oh God, I'm going to get someone killed, bullcrap. But it was just so much cuter. She knew she was going to die. She knew she was going to be gone. She just wanted to have that moment to spend some time with him. The Nayagiri was real, man. She was being so damn sweet. And it made it so much worse because you knew it was coming. She was planting all those death flags on herself. Ah, oh, so painful. So damn painful, man. And then, yeah, as she did start to fall asleep, that little smile that she gave, it was so sweet. It was so loving. And you just knew she wasn't waking up again. And they really tried to play it off for us. I mean, <laughs> once they showed the waking up, they started it by showing us Ruruka's body. And that threw me by a bit of a loop. I mean, I know somebody on Reddit, I had seen the theory, somebody suggested that maybe Kirigiri had a time limit. That after a certain amount of times of falling asleep, she was going to be gone. And man, it was <laughs> oh, just so intense to me. Knowing that theory, seeing everything going down. But then when I saw the knife in Rurika, I thought maybe she had a chance. But no, nah, she was gone. Oh, so painful. So, I mean, there is so much theorizing going on about this death right now. A lot of people are thinking there's no way it can happen. A lot of people are in denial. And I mean, I think it's a good reason to be in denial for this one. I mean, for one thing, a lot of people have noticed that pill bottle that bounces away as Asahina moves in towards Kyoko. The fact that Kirigiri has her detective notebook hidden underneath her body, just to make sure that Naegi will be able to get it and read it. Possibility is that she did leave a message to him in there. And you know, it links with all of my thoughts, all of my theories from before. I said way back in episode one, when it came to Chisa being dead and Seiko being around as the ultimate pharmacist, I said way back then, what if the Jagger, what if the NG codes just actually put you to sleep and put you to a point where you've nearly had your heart stopped? And then some way to wake you up could come into effect. Especially since we had Seiko in Despair Arc working on something she called a reanimator. Something to bring back the dead, essentially. Maybe it can't work on 100% dead people, but instead works on people that are in this kind of state and almost comatose, heart barely beating, but being kept just alive enough that the brain doesn't die kind of state. In that case, yeah, those pills on the ground, maybe Kitty Giddy, while investigating all these bodies, put everything together. I mean, she seemed to understand a lot more than she was letting on. And if my theory is right about this killing game actually being all about setting up hope, then yeah, I can totally see her working this whole thing out taking that cure from Seiko and working her way towards actually letting it know in the notebook, hey, I'm not actually dead. Just, you know, pop some of these pills in my mouth and I'll be fine kind of thing. Although there's also the chance that it won't work and that's more of a hint than anything. I mean, we saw Seiko actually pour some of her original cure. We're not sure if it was the cure W that she was carrying at the end, but it was a bright green liquid that she poured into Bandai's mouth, like literally right after he'd gotten hit by the NG code and it didn't work. So there is the chance that right now Seiko doesn't actually have the medicine to save them on her. 
But, you know, I'll come back to that later. There's always a chance that there is a medicine out there that can revive people that have actually been hit by the NG code poison and by the knives. It's just that you wouldn't exactly know immediately. It would have to be something that's outside of the building, something that you only get once the game is done. If my theory is right, I mean, and it was all set up by Chisa and some other people to cure Munikata, the future foundation of despair. But you know, that's the theory I'm bringing out tomorrow, so I'll talk about that more tomorrow. First off, goddamn, that was all just talking about Kirigiri. A lot happened in this episode, man. Sakakura, Jesus Christ. I like Sakakura, man. I really like Sakakura. It took him a while to grow on me. Because at first he just seemed like a psycho. And then I got that he basically is just a mad dog. He just likes to punch his problems. I have said that dozens of times at this point. And I like that kind of character. He's so simple. He just wants to be able to be useful to Minukata Kyosuke. Oh, man. So seeing him in this episode being so loyal as an attack dog should be. <laughs> and just ending up losing that suddenly. I mean, Munikata just stabbed him through the chest and that was it. It was over. Juzo didn't get his chance to actually return a punch. He didn't get his chance to activate his NG code and leave with like a good line about Chisa. He never got to find Chisa's body. So that was just too painful for me. I want to believe he's not actually dead. I want to believe that because Munikata didn't actually stab him through the heart, Sakakura is actually alive, just really badly damaged and he'll come back eventually and actually gain some redemption for himself in the form of going against Munikata to protect Naegi. Because we all know Naegi ain't going to win against Munikata when it comes to just a battle of words. Munikata ain't that kind of guy. He's all about the stabby stabby right now. Man. So yeah, I'm sticking with my theory right now about what Munikata's plan is. At this point, I think he is just planning on killing everyone in the building and possibly himself at the end too. He may not want himself to survive this at all either. He may just want to be done with everything and let the Future Foundation carry on without any of them. If nothing else, I think this episode disproves at least part of the evidence for the Asahina theory. Not all of it, mind you. I do like the Asahina being Chisa theory. <laughs> Even though I don't completely agree with it, there is some pretty cool evidence in there. But I think this does disprove the idea that he was going after Asahina when he said, there you are, despair, and like, she was on the black side of the sword and Makoto was on the white. Because in this episode, he was like, straight up, you'll pay for making me kill him, despair. So, you know, it felt to me like he's just talking about despair in general. Everyone around him, to him right now, is despair. Everyone needs to be gotten rid of. He can't trust anyone. He's lost it, basically. He doesn't trust anyone in the building and he wants them all dead. That is my feeling on it anyway. I mean, that was my feeling last week. And, you know, it's only gotten stronger now. He's acting so emotionless at this point. I mean, he showed a bit of emotion in this episode. He felt bad about killing Sakakura. He didn't react to Seiko's death or Kizakura's death at all, which is kind of sad because, I mean, even Sakakura felt bad for Seiko. And it was Munakada who originally recruited Seiko and gave her that bit of happiness. Like, when she got kicked out of Hope's Peak, instantly he was there to pick her up and take her in. So the fact that he didn't care at all about her death is just speaking volumes about how far gone he is. I mean, he's already lost his two best friends now. In fact, he's probably killed both of them himself. So that sucks. He's a psycho now. He's completely infested with despair. Or as I like to call it, I take it from the psychopath style and call him criminally asymptomatic where he doesn't realise that what he's doing is so psychotic. He thinks he's working for hope. I mean, he said it in this episode. That he wants to become the ultimate hope. That he wants to defeat Makoto Naegi's hope and be the only hope there is. It's just his form of hope is eliminating every bit of despair. For that, he's like started to fill himself with despair and taken on the role of being the serial killer, really. I mean, that's it. He's killing everyone, then he'll probably take himself out at the end. He just wants to be done with it. He wants everyone in the building on. So yeah, that's my feeling on that. Oh, and Sakakura was so close to giving us a little revelation there. I mean, he had that moment when he looked at Munikada and he said he wanted to tell him something and Munikada just stabbed him anyway. Said he already knew. 
I'm not sure if that was all the idea of Sakakura planning to admit his feelings for Chisa. Or, you know, if some people are right, his feelings for Minokata. I still think he liked Chisa rather than Minokata. But, you know, other people could be right. I'm not going to argue with them at that. But, yeah. Sakakura, man, he was just so loyal. Wanted to go along with whatever Munakata wanted to do. It was so fucking horrible. Oh, man. And, you know, we got to see a lot more NG codes in this one, which was interesting. Because we now know that Monica knew all of these NG codes. I'm assuming that when she hacked into the building's mainframe, that's how she managed to get all this information. And she's had it all this time, which annoys me so much. I mean, maybe that's the point when she found out that Kyoko Kirigiri was going to die because of Makoto Naegi. Because, man, her NG code was evil. I mean, not just the idea of the fourth time limit, but then also the fact that if she never wanted to, she could have just killed Naegi and she would have been fine. She would have survived. I mean, there were a lot of the NG codes that worked in that kind of way. Izayoi's and Ruruka's ones kind of worked against each other, setting up that trap door in the room so that as soon as they found it, Ruruka would be completely messed up by the entire idea. The fact that Chisa's NG code was straight up Munakata dying. So if Munakata had gotten killed or Munakata had been put out of the game, that would have been it. Chisa would have been gone too. Which can kind of explain some things, but yeah, I'll go into that tomorrow as well. Oh man, so damn good. And Gozu's one, which was just straight up wrestling. He can't be pinned to a count of three. <laughs> I'm wondering if that's how he actually died. I mean, if him and Miaya were actually awake at the same time. Miaya, of course, the robot. Mecha Gahara being controlled by Monica. What if she knew his NG code at that point and just straight up... As soon as he woke up, jumped on top of him, pinned him to the ground and let him die that way. That could be an interesting idea. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Just the new NG codes were cool. The fact that Munakada now knows everyone's. Oh, so sick. And the fact that he like is so sure of himself now. He's like, I'm not wrong. He's not even just questioning it anymore. He's straight up decided what he's doing is the right option. He was goading Naegi at the end of the episode, bullying him about Kirigiri's death. That was so fucked up, man. I thought Makoto was actually going to go a bit insane there. I really did think when he looked up, his eyes would be full of anger. But then we got that little flashback of him remembering Kirigiri n telling him not to fall into despair and that she'd always be there beside him. Man, that was sweet. And yeah, when he looked up and his eyes were just full of determination rather than anger. That was a cool touch. I was happy with that. I'm going to be a lot more happy at seeing how he handles it from here on. Because it looks like he's ready to go full man mode and actually put some plans into action. I'm wondering if he will read Kirigiri's notebook or if he's going to go straight to Munakada. I mean, we need some confirmation on who had those pills. Were those pills next to her body? Just to let them know. Is it just a hint or does she straight up have the explanation in her notebook? Can they save her? Is that actually going to work? Or is it just like a little thing, you know, hinting at them that there's got to be a way to save them? I don't know. I just really, I'm so excited for this next episode. It was so good. And, you know, we got that ultra conclusion to Izayoi and Ruruka's story. Izayoi, man. Straight up, husbando material. He was so damn sweet. I mean, he's been with Ruruka for so long. And he loved her so much. He was straight up. Like he found out about her NG code. And that's why he set up all those traps and blocked the door. He made sure that no one would be getting out of there. He was protecting Ruruka. And yet she couldn't trust him. I, yeah, like I totally understand what kind of personality she has. I can tell that throughout her life, probably in her early childhood, she ended up being betrayed a lot. And that's why she's got this ultra distrust of everyone. But, you know, at this point, you just can't reconcile her behavior. No matter how scared she is, she fucking fed her boyfriend goddamn candy that she probably knew was going to kill him. I mean, she didn't react at all to the thing, just cried. So she knew it was going to kill him. She did it anyway, just because she couldn't trust him. And he was fine with it. 
He then went ahead and kissed her again as he was dying. Told her, I love you. Oh, I crushed my soul. I loved Easy Oi so much. He was just so sweet, so protective of her. And she, this is the thing. She just uses people. I mean, say what you will. She did feel bad about getting rid of Izzy Oi. And especially when it came to right before her death, she was feeling even worse. She was going a bit insane with it. She was talking about how, oh, it's okay. If I get out of here, I'll be able to make lots more friends. Like, trying to rationalize it to herself when really, obviously, you know, she's falling into despair at that point. She's gone insane. She's realized she's hurt so many people. I mean, you also have that really nice artistic moment that really shows how much she knows she's fucked up because she's moving the rocks and then she literally looks down at her hands covered in blood. And not just anyone's blood, but her own blood. So, like, it's the way of saying she's got blood on her hands and it's mostly her own because she's fucked up herself by not trusting Seiko, by not trusting Izioi. She's ruined her relationships with them and doomed herself to this. And she kind of deserves the punishment that she gets. But <laughs> the punishment she actually did get, man, it was just too damn far. It was straight up torture before she got killed. And that's what was interesting about it. She got the traitor knife through her heart, but unlike the rest of the bodies, she hasn't been strung up in the air at all. And unlike the other bodies, it isn't just the stab through the heart. Every other body, there were no other physical signs of trauma. I mean, yes, you had Gozu with his mask eyes split open. I think that was more of the blood forcing its way out of his face than anything else, to be honest. And then with Seiko, there was the idea of her being slammed into the wall. But that could just as easily be to keep her suspended in the air. To keep her, you know, at a position where she's actually up off the ground. Then when it came to Ruruka, it was straight up. She was stabbed all over her thighs. She had, like, her right hand looked like it was blackened in some way. As if it had been burned or maybe crushed and swolled with blood. And then she had the knife actually through her chest. Man, that was powerful. And that death got me really thinking. Because <laughs> it was so different from all the other ones. And it looked very familiar to me. I mean, straight away, you saw those leg stabbings. That is straight up how Nagito tortured himself before he killed himself in Danganronpa 2. So, I gotta question it. Was it Nagito that ended up doing this killing? Is that why it was such an aggressive and torturous killing? Because... She straight up had lost all hope. She wasn't going to bring anyone hope. She was just bringing despair. And, you know, he's already got his ultimate despair out there in the world. He doesn't need Ruriko to be despair filled. So maybe he was just pissed off at her and wanted to get rid of her in a painful way. Oh, man. If that was Nagito. That's just my initial thought from seeing the body. It was so much like his murder. I mean, the stab through the chest rather than the stomach where the spear got him. The right hand being blackened, being damaged in some way because he had a knife through his hand in his game. And the leg stabbings is exactly how he stabbed and tortured himself before he did any of the impalement or anything. So, yeah, I feel that's what's being hinted at there. But at the same time, there is one other person in the building who could have done a murder that brutal. And that would be Seiko, <laughs> who I don't think would actually do it. That's the thing. But yeah, when she was in, like, feral form, as I'll call it, when she took all the super drugs, she would definitely be all about slicing and gouging and breaking. I wouldn't be surprised if that could have been her handiwork. But yeah, honestly, it feels more like an Agito thing. It feels like a calculated torture thing than a straight up ravaged like mad. And, you know, we don't know if Seiko can wake up again. We don't know 100% what's going on with the knives and the NG codes and... The possible cure and all of that stuff going on. So for now, I do think it's just yet another hint that Nagito is in on all of this. Or hell, it could have even been Mitsurai Ryota if he managed to get out of his own room, go to her room and, you know, was really pissed off about what she did to Izioi, I guess. I mean, there is all that candy, like, in her mouth and all around her as well. So it would be someone that knew exactly what she did to Izioi. God damn. But, you know... Let me know you guys' ideas in the comment section below. Because, you know, I love the idea of Nagito coming back. And I know a lot of people just don't. And don't want him to be anywhere near Mariahen. I can completely understand that. But, yeah, I could imagine his bullshit luck waking him up out of the game when he died in the game. And him sneaking aboard the vessel and going ahead with them to the Future Foundation. But that's just me. So, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. 
because that's all I'm going to do for this review because I'm going to have a theory video coming out tomorrow. It's going to be called The Remnants of Hope Theory. It's the one that I've been talking about for a long time involving Chisa, Tengen, and a few other people as the mastermind and, you know, this whole killing game being set up for hope. I mean, I've even said so many times about the idea of a cure that could bring them back even if they got knifed or poisoned. And this episode has dropped more hints towards that with that cure bouncing around Kirigiri's body. So we'll see. I'm definitely doing that video tomorrow. I'll make sure that comes out because now it just feels so secure in my mind. But yeah, let me know you guys' thoughts in the comment section. And if you enjoyed this review, wreck that like button like you mean it. Subscribe if you haven't already to see more. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you.